This week, we welcome Wen Shortau to discuss the art and science of metawar. In the leadership and communication section, a CISO's actionable strategy for success. Security basics aren't so basic, they're hard. Building a security culture where employees feel free to speak up and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Weekly. If your organization is ready to embrace edge computing, we have good news. The 2023 AT&T Cybersecurity Insights Report provides everything you need to know to get started. In the report, we identify the common characteristics of edge computing. We found edge use cases are rapidly coming online, and we reveal how to secure edge computing, which is a dynamic, nonlinear, and unconventional approach to computing. Most importantly, you'll learn how to prepare for your edge ecosystem. Get your complimentary copy of the report today by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash ATT cybersecurity. That's securityweekly.com forward slash ATT cybersecurity. According to the 2022 Data Breach Investigations Report, the human remains the number one driver of breaches today, demonstrating that cybersecurity is no longer just a technical challenge, but a human one as well. But how do you manage the human risks of cybersecurity? It starts with measurement. Only by effectively quantifying human risk can organizations engage employees with relevant activities to truly change human behavior. That's human risk management. Map key human behaviors to the business risks that matter most to your organization for free by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash living security. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 318, recorded August 28th, 2023. I am your host, Matt Alderman. Joining remotely are my co-hosts. Welcome back first, Mr. Jason Albuquerque. We missed you last week. Hey there. I know. I had a little bit of PTO scheduled. We're uh, closing out the summer here with the kids getting ready to go back to school in a couple of weeks. And hey, by the way, I'm super excited. Week and a half. Football. It starts. NFL starts, baby. Week one. Yeah, some interesting final trades going around right now. Everybody's trying to build out their teams. That's it. Prepping for week one. We've got a week and a half. Yep. I love it. Also joining this week, Mr. Ben Carr. Welcome back, Ben. Hey, Matt. How's it going? Just uh, enjoying a little bit cooler weather here, a little bit of rain. Kids are back in school and just, uh, yeah, moving forward with the house, getting some stone on it. So things are good. Nice. Finally got under 100 degrees for once. <laughs> yeah, crazy. Security Weekly listeners, InfoSec World 2023 is just weeks away. Have you registered to join over 2,500 cybersecurity experts on September 25th to 27th in Lake Buena Vista, Florida? InfoSec World is your gateway to a world of, world of knowledge and growth. Don't miss the chance to enhance your career, connect with industry leaders, and make an impact on the rapidly evolving landscape. Secure your seat using code isw Sec week 20 to save 20% off your registration. Register today at securityweekly.com forward slash InfoSec World 2023. For most people, Wynn does not need an introduction. Wynn has lived cybersecurity since 1983 and now says, I think maybe I just, I'm just starting to understand it. I, I'm still not there, Wynn. His prediction about the internet and security have been scarily spot on. He coined the term electronic Pearl Harbor while testifying before Congress in 1991. His seminal book, Information Warfare, showed the world how and why massive identity theft, cyber espionage, nation state hacking, and cyber terrorism would be an integral part of the future. Today's present. Wynn, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Hey, Matt. How are you? How are you? Good, good, good. We've, we, you and I, we were, we were trying to figure out when we actually met. We were on a plane ride, I think, to Vegas for Black Hat. You came out with your analog security book. You're like, oh, you got to read this. You got to read this. 
you, but yeah. you're getting ready to write a new one. So, or, or you're kind of writing it. We're going to talk about it today. I don't, I don't know how far you are in the process. I hope it's more than just kind of writing at this point. <laughs> All right, we're going to talk about the metaverse. We're going to talk about meta war. But before we get into meta war, let what is what is the metaverse? Let's start with a basic understanding definition of what is the metaverse. You ask a million people, you can get a million different answers. Uh, when people typically think of the metaverse today, they've got this uh, Ready Player One, uh, Snow Crash, Neil Stevenson, holodeck kind of. Uh, uh, impression of complete 100 percent immersion in an alternate reality an alternate virtual existence if you will uh that is indistinguishable from our consensual hallucination as we know reality to be that is what most people are talking about but that is if ever we're going to have that technology but we're incrementally getting there i have chosen uh, over the last couple of years of work to look at the metaverse differently, that the metaverse is about immersion. It's about storytelling. It's about capturing one's imagination to become inside of somebody else's head or temporarily inside another reality, uh, watching a great movie that captivates you. That is a metaverse, listening to immersive music. Ah, oh, that's a metaverse as well. So was uh, Plato and these guys talking hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, around campfires, telling stories. The metaverse is about telling stories, convincing you of realities, and then let's add a whole lot of technology to it, and that's when things start to get much more interesting and much more scary. Yeah, and I think the the interesting part about the it, it's this evolving thing, right? It's 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 aspects of art, uh, art. What is it? Artificial reality, virtual reality. There's aspects of social media and social presence in here. It, there is no like defined like space. I mean, th isn't this why Facebook changed their name to Meta because they just want to play in all of this stuff? Um, they changed the name. I. I... As to why, I got to imagine that was Zuck making some decision to decide to name the company uh, with a Greek prefix that has no trademark or ability. Uh, but yeah, his vision of the metaverse is very similar to trying to reach the Neil Stevenson uh, all immersive existence. Uh, unfortunately, that first step from everything we've been able to hear, they added ten billion dollar legs to the avatars and i'm not sure that's <laughs> compelling enough to start bringing people into this kind of environment now now when you had mentioned that you know we're not quite there yet but what i'm seeing is that corporate america and governments are starting to invest a ton of money in mm -hmm. in in the metaverse so i mean all, all of this investment has to be for a reason right and i start thinking immersion starts creating that ability for manipulation, right? Now that you have governments involved and things of that nature, now, you know, my, my, my risk radar starts going way up where you can start manipulating and indoctrinating folks with, with this type of technology. What, what, what are you seeing out there from investments from government entities into this the, technology? I'm gonna stick right now with the goodness of the metaverse. What can be done that is really cool? And you're seeing in a lot of large corporations and the government, of uh, the uh, concept of digital twinning. And yep. you're making a digital twin of a factory, of a tank, of a manufacturing process, some large kinetic system that heretofore we'd have to build to iron the bugs out. With the metaverse in the sense of using it for digital twins, then that becomes a great application. Uh, can it be weaponized? Sure, but that's a, a separate discussion. Uh, it can be used for education in ways that uh, have not been really applied yet. For example, do you want your 16-year-old to start driving out on the highway right away? Or how about uh, several months of emergional experiences like we do pilots? Uh, how about police and law enforcement uh, EMTs that have experience that doesn't have to be real life at first, where they can get huge amounts of experience in an immersive environment before being deployed with guns or needles or 
cars on the highway. There's a tremendous amount of good applications for this. And where you've been taking it down manipulation, that is uh, the path that certainly I explore in the art and science of metal war as how to orchestrate these types of realities. Yeah, I mean, that's 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 a perfect example. I mean, I've seen um, everywhere from, you know, uh, oil companies using it to train folks and get them used to, you know, folks who'd be working in dangerous situations, getting them the training with the digital twinning and, and doing that immersive training up front, uh, doing it for testing and, and getting folks experience. But, you know, it's the blessing and the curse of the technology. So, you know, being I, in the cybersecurity realm, you you always start looking at the risks. But yeah, no, I've seen that in action as well. All of that yeah, that, on, the, on the positive side. When I began this project a couple of years ago, I was under the impression uh, to myself, and I had fooled myself, that I was merely going to be looking at the hardware technology, the software technologies of how to make metaversal experiences actually dynamic with minimal latency and all the tech that's required, and what are the security and privacy implications. And I began looking at it from that traditional viewpoint. And as I got further and further into it and the implications of it, because I was looking at it purely through the time domain, uh, how long does it take a human being to react to something? Uh, from balance from the ear to the eye, how long does that take? How long does pain take? How long do sensorial inputs take to process in order to get a response? And when I started looking at it, I realized that at the end of the day, we are starting to merge carbon systems, us, with silicon systems, whatever those are going to be today and in the future. And the coexistence of them in a immersive environment is really leading us down the path of thinking, what does it mean to be human? And who's really in control? And when you look at the dynamic loops of the effects of sensory input, output, tracking, and what have you, uh, and all the numbers that occur within the brain, you start coming up with some disturbing questions that don't have any good, hard answers yet. Right up where uh, philosopher David Chalmers has said, what is consciousness? And some of this work in the metaverse actually comes down to um, one's self-identity and how much control and agency we really have over ourselves. And neuroscience doesn't have that answer yet. And, and when, when, I, that you know, when I saw that you were going to be a guest on the show, and we were, you know, we were talking about and, and just reading up on you a little bit, talking about that full immersion, um, you know, I sat back and I said, in order for these companies to be able to fully immerse us in this experience, they're going to need to be able to um, tap into our senses, but also tap into our experiences. I mean, our reality is my experience in life. It's my reality. My reality is a little bit different from yours, but then it's also my senses, my smell, my touch, my taste. You know, do you see these companies getting to that point where they're able to manipulate that experience to the point of sense and taste and pain and things of that nature, and then monitor us for how we're reacting to it? Because I'm going to, I may react to an experience a little bit more different than you, just from my upbringing and my experiences and what I've had throughout my life? Do you see them getting that deep? Oh, that, that's a perfect question. And the answer is yes. Uh, the longer answer is how long will it take and what is going to be the dri driving force behind it? Is it going to be all about money? Is it going to be all about manipulation, disinformation, and uh, uh, perception management? Uh, or is it going to be taking it slower for real applications as we learn how to really use it? So there's not a hard answer here. It's As Matt said earlier, this is an evolving world. And I don't believe that every iteration of the metaverse that we come up with or that exists today uh, are all going to exist, nor are they going to all end up in the same place. Uh, the Roblox uh, metaverse, if you will. It has some great applications for some specific things, and it has some limitations. As we start monitoring our senses and do more body tracking and take that information and feed it back to where the orchestration of the content delivery to our external senses are, once those go together 
And then you look at the timing elements of the carbon set, uh, network and you look at the timing elements of the silicon network, creating reality as close as we can is about synchronizing those two. And that's going to have to adjust from your particular body dynamics and physiologies, my particular ones that are going to be different. The timing is going to be different. Uh, the reaction bases are going to be different. But here's what gets really scary. When we look at the world of privacy today, uh, one of the big words that we're all, the compliance people especially use PII, personally identifiable information, which in my opinion is going to be almost worthless in, and I'll say five to seven years. Why? Because that's static information that has a time limitation of value. Uh, that's why only certain lengths, uh, types of crypto are needed for certain types of transactions because of the latency and value period of the information being protected. When we do the same thing to human beings and the PII goes away, what do we have? We have PIB, personally identifiable behavior. And these systems, because of the way the memory is going to work, the way that the offloading of, of data from edge servers to central servers is going to work, we're going to have huge amounts of behavioral based data that's going to know over time exactly how Win or Matt or anyone is going to react under given conditions. Are we going to be there tomorrow? No, but we're inching there more and more and more. So, when if you if you think about that, you know, you said you were going to stay on the on the positive and the the good side of this, but I can think of a lot of a lot of potential negative impacts or utilization or misuse of this, right? Oh, yeah. And I, I guess doesn't it must concern you? It concerns me, like how this stuff could potentially be misused. Uh, we want to think about our our current reality as you know, however we define it, it, it's something that is real and therefore cannot be necessarily manipulated in, in, to, to a large extent, right? That, that evolution of thought may change at some point. But when we start talking about a digital reality and the meta, then we start to think about a reality that can be manipulated, tweaked, adjusted for good or for bad. And so mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, what you think about that and potentially the controls, especially as you just talked about with that behavioral information, you know, being able to manipulate that and use that as needed. You're making the argument that I fully agree with that effectively today's version of the metaverse, and let's just call that social media today. And we add yeah. in some uh, Photoshopping and now we got better and better deep fakes. That is the world of storytelling today. If we take the concept and agree that the metaverse, no matter what iteration it is, is about storytelling, that first step is to tell the story. But in order to tell a story, I need to give you some level of immersive experience, shutting your eyes and becoming part of the great tale of Odysseus and the Aegean back 2,500 years ago. Does that immerse you? Maybe. But that immersive requires also, by definition, a little bit of reality distortion. In order to get you to believe and buy into the story, I also have to give you disinformation. That's all absolutely required, regardless of how immersive the experience is. We're already seeing a great deal of this. We've seen the effects of great orators alone over hundreds of years. And then we've seen the effect of Orson Welles. We just added in some audio over a big clunky speaker in 1938, and people go rioting in the streets. All slight increases in the immersiveness of the experience. So we're there today, and we know that we're there today because of the total schism between information, disinformation, truth, belief, and all of these fuzzy areas that science says are all in the middle but people that have belief in the absolute sense of the word uh, are on either end of the curve and that is where the schism is between absolutism and a spectrum of possibilities in the middle and no matter what technology we're using the effects ultimately are going to be the same because you're trying to mess with the human brain one way or another so ultimately, how do we deal with the disinformation, right? How do we deal with the fact that 
people are going to want to participate in this, and I think there is a lot of potential for good. We've outlined some of those cases already, right, where it does make a lot of sense to, to utilize this. But as we move forward, how do we keep on a path forward as a society that doesn't devolve into, you know, just a large disinformation stream that no one can trust any of the realities presented to them? Well, we're, we're kind of almost there today. Um, if, he, if you continue the storytelling uh, stream uh, after disinformation, part of that is the next step is manipulation. In the good sense, I really want to enjoy this Mary Poppins movie, and I want to be manipulated to be happy as part of it. I can also manipulate content in other ways, and I'll explain how that's done you know, with the amygdala in a minute. Then, after we have manipulation, we're currently doing this. We have reward systems, and those reward systems are NFTs. A lot of kids love those, and they play. Uh, then you've got the digital opioids that are the serotonin and dopamine uh, influence, the little jabs every time somebody likes something. And so you have reward that comes along, and then when you get those injections of feel-good, then you have a level of addiction. And once you've got the addiction, you have compliance, and then the next step is falling into belief. So from a psychology and neuroscience standpoint, we know how to get from point A to point B in the good way. And in the book, I go into a lot of detail uh, mathematically and uh, time analysis-wise as how to orchestrate for evil as well. Because if we don't understand how to attack, we're not going to learn how to defend. So once you have all these, there's only three possible ways to take a look at defense. Uh, one is technical, and uh, that's not going to really go terribly well uh, if we look at it from a purely technical standpoint, because any sort of jitter between the carbon networks and the silicon networks would be the equivalent, roughly, of a glitch in the matrix. Synchronization has to be achieved. So is that going to work or not work in order? Who's in charge? Ultimately, the silicon is in charge because our reaction times are between six and nine orders of magnitude slower than these systems that we're going to be tying to. So that's pretty damn significant. Uh, obviously, then we can go down the policy route. Uh, do we want to have digital opioids in the hands of eight-year-olds because we know what's going to happen? Do we want to allow in online experiences meta rape? Where are the lines? How do we start creating some level of policy as we are digitally terraforming the future into Web 3.0? All of those are very soft. The one that I have become incredibly intrigued with is the concept of mental inoculation, taking advantage of the typically unused portion of our mind called our mental immune system. And it's a combination of how we have learned, how we have already become programmed uh, to whoever we are right now. This is the result of programming from external experience, plus whatever has my memories and those experiences that are hard-coded, especially in the amygdala. That's the emotional center. We need to target that. There was work begun, uh, the mental inoculation theory from 1961. The first experiments to ever really be done to show that this idea of mental inoculation as a result of global misinformation was only begun in 2019. And so the studies are brand new. But what it shows is that using specific types of mental inoculation techniques in a gamified environment will decrease on one inoculation, people's, abil people's ability to distinguish misinformation from disinformation by 52%. Early science is saying this is the way to go. And thus far, the, I am very, very impressed with the uh, studies that have been done. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I, I look, I think this is a large area of, of thought that we need to dive deeper into. And I think that's a, that's a great place to start. Um, I just, like I said, being coming from the security side, ev everything, I look at the negative and I look at the positive and try to make the balance. And I think you've highlighted, uh, I think there is a lot of positive, but a lot of potential for misuse and, and the negative. And so I think that's insightful. Yeah. I, and, and I think, I think there's a combination of risk here, right? 
not only being able to manipulate the future, but I'm scared that history is going to be rewritten and that, you know, propaganda will win at the end and, and the ability to manipulate history. That's a scary thing. You know, change the course of what's happened in this world. Not that we haven't done it already, you know, to some degree over time, but I think this just gives it a rocket booster. Are you talking about changing history from this point forward or retrospectively I think, rewriting? I think the retro. History? Yeah, I, I think, think Jason's retro. pointing at the retro, right? It's the it's the changing yeah. our reality in a new mm -hmm. reality. One one of the things that I, when you talk like that, it brings up um Oliver Stone's movie, JFK. I forget the number, but some significant percentage of the population believes that's history. Right. Not a right. Yeah. novelized interpretation, whatever we want to call it, but it's not mm -hmm. history. And when you have snippets of information, 40 minute documentaries on Netflix, mm -hmm. and a good number of them are full of technical. Well, I can't say it on the show. Uh, as as we well know, people mm -hmm. are buying all of this stuff because they the lack of learning how to do critical thinking, learning how to question. These are fundamental aspects of not having your mental immune system attuned to a, a real world. Our mental immune system is still tuned as though we were walking in the jungle with wild animals 10,000 years ago, and we have not evolved it yet. And that's part of why I'm so excited about some of this work uh, that has been pioneered out of uh, University of Cambridge. But one last thing Will, uh, Will, yeah. that I had on my, on my list here. You know, you talked about it earlier, and I wrote it down because I wanted to touch on it before we, we, we ended this. You talked about orchestration of this metaverse. And, you know, I, I'd like to dive a little deep into that. The mm -hmm. orchestration of this metaverse, is this, is this human intervention? Or are we at a point now where we should start worrying about, in all the buzz, AI, right? AI all machine right. orchestration of this metaverse. I, I where, think are this is a, and where are we headed? This is like you've already read a good portion of what I've been writing. Uh, the, the question is absolutely spot on. Um, I, I come from the music industry and I did some TV work and movie work back in the day. And when you go into the recording studio with 40 musicians, they've all got their music sheets and the orchestrator wrote the flute part and the trumpet part and the guitar part. And you have this orchestration. Michael Jackson did the thriller dance. That was an orchestration. A movie is an orchestration of a combination of primarily today audio and video sensory inputs to us. And that's where we get roughly 93, 94% of our external sensory input is from just from eyes and from ears. And this is an evolutionary survival mechanism. The orchestration in the metaverse is gonna be very, very similar. Um, let's not go just a couple years in the future and say that the orchestration is gonna be completely ambisonic. I'm gonna have full 360 audio, so that every time I hear a sound over here, I'm gonna have a reaction. I'm, I'm gonna create that emotional reaction to a sound that, again, is my lizard brain reacting from who we were 10,000 years ago. Visually, the same sort of thing, the orchestration of what I see. Keep in mind that the eyes only see 2% of their visual field. Everything else, the other 98% is memory and fill in by some really cool processes. The, the, the eye is absolutely amazing. So the other thing that happens is we have blind spots and those blind spots allow a content orchestrator who's building the audio, the video, the sound effects, your immersive experience to take advantage of blind spots and be able to speak directly to your unconscious mind, not only your conscious mind. So one of the ethical questions that has to come as well is should content orchestration, you know, we'll buy it on a DVD or you download the app or you're living in, a, in the metaverse, should it be able to influence you legally or morally to do or behave or track you in ways that are unknown to you? Should it be able to directly target your unconscious mind and not your frontal conscious, uh, your, your conscious mind? So there's some huge questions here that are 
all of your absolutely spot on. But initially, it's going to be we're going to design a metaverse. Some game designers are going to do a thing. Cool. And they'll tie together and we're going to learn how to do all that better. Then within 12 months, I'll say, they're going to throw on the AI on top of it in order to get that automatic feedback loop occurring between our body sensors, the haptics that are going on, our biosensing results, the tracking with the orchestration. And that entire sum, regardless of how many senses you're influencing, that is content orchestration for the metaverse, regardless of how many you're dealing with. And that is a use case that AI can already basically support today. Because the best use cases for things like generative AI are content creation, image uh, identification and selection. That's where the technologies have a, a sweet spot right now. So to make that leap isn't that hard. We're already there. No, we're, 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 we're and I'm not going to use the word leap because I, I, you know, Matt, I hate binary stuff. Um, it's some of the visuals that you're going to see in, for example, the uh, Apple, what is that called? The Vision Pro? Was that the name of it? Uh, you're going to be seeing some increased uh, resolution, but it's not real resolution. It's called foveated rendering. In order to get uh, a simulated field of view of that which we see, roughly 210 degrees wide, we think we see, we only see 2% of it. So why do we need to, in a digital environment, resolve all of this? when I really only need to resolve this little bit because with trackers, I'll be able to understand the saccadic movements and the foveated motion of what's going on in the retina. Once I can do that, it's just going to get technically better and better and better until we reach um, a retinal vision. Retinal vision will sit somewhere between 8 and 12K is uh, the best guesses right now. That's nothing from a data side at all. Like eight oh, okay. Ks, peanuts. But it's an awful lot of data in order to correlate when you've got an endpoint that's going to require massive bandwidth. Edge processing, what's going to go on at the edge, that which needs to be changed the most processing is going to be need to change the most often. And you're going to have various layers of servers uh, that are going to be used based upon how interactive and how dense the information transfer is going to be. And this is what's where I started looking at it from the uh, pure cybersecurity standpoint. I started there saying this is going to be incredible and hard, if not impossible, to secure in the traditional ways that we think about information security. I, I have talked to a lot of people in the last two years on this. And the best we come up with is some sort of synchronized neutrality. But that doesn't change what's the content delivery. We're going to leave it there, Wynn, because this was a great conversation. We could probably go on for another half an hour. Thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Oh, I am to have these questions. The level of questions was astounding. I really appreciate it. You guys are really getting it, and that, that means a great deal to me. Fabulous. All right, folks, we're going to take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. 